OK, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for joining us and attending our third uh, in a series of webinars that we're putting on for our Greek members. Previous two were centred around uh, bulk carrier cargoes. So it's only fair we include everybody this time and we're going to move on to uh, cargo to contamination on tankers, causes and cures. Just a couple of rules, uh, very simple. When we are in the webinar and it's on, if we could remain on mute, please. Uh, otherwise, we get some really bad echoes and it affects other people's listening in. Um, and if you have a question, by all means, ask it at any point in the webinar. We have no problems with answering questions as we go along or you can wait to the end if you wish. That is entirely up to you. But if you remain muted, you'll see in the top of your screen there, there's a small um, text bubble where you can type your question out and uh, we will read it, uh, read it out to the webinar and uh, try our best to answer it. If you think of any questions after the webinar is finished, there'll be a couple of email addresses uh, on the last slide of the webinar and you can email us after the fact anytime you want at your leisure and uh, we'll also make our best efforts answering your questions at that time as well. So simple rules done. OK, so on to the panel. Um, very pleased to have uh, James van der Heen with us. I'm sorry, James, if I have butchered the pronunciation of your name with my uh, English. Uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself a little further on mute? Well, I'm uh, James van der Heyden, to say <laughs> properly. Um, I've been in the marine surveying business for the last 15 years. I've recently, recently changed from BMT to uh, the Haas van Oosterhout. And one of my core businesses is uh, Tankers. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, myself and James met uh, when he was working for BMT, so it's good to have you on board. Thanks for joining us, James. Uh, from north, it'll be myself, uh, I, uh, the main contact for loss prevention in Greece. Some of you may have met me. I'm pleased that my colleague Rod Matan, who's also a master mariner, is joining us today with his tanker experience. Rasmus Tiedman from our Piraeus office, and finally Captain Gag and Dylan from the Newcastle office. It's great to have uh, the, the claims guys on board to give us that, that other angle to what we're discussing. I think Gagan would like to discuss with you some of the statistics uh, about this. Uh, Gagan? Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, th th this is basically to show you that there is an issue and where the issue lies. We thought we'd start off with some general stats. Uh, just by the sheer number of claims that we get and deal with at the club on for tankers, there are nearly equal number of tanker contamination and tanker shortage claims. However, the reason we are running the tanker contamination claims webinar first is because uh, of this, which is that the cost of contamination of uh, cargo on tankers substantially supersedes the amount that we spend on any other type of claim on tankers. Uh, while both numbers and values uh, are, are important and, uh, and they, they should be looked at, when we look at number of claims for tanker contamination, they remain fairly consistent year on year. And that is concerning and hence this webinar. Uh, John? Thanks, Gagan. Yeah, exactly right. And um, we've looked and discussed internally about those and the subjects that we're going to discuss here are those that we see relatively commonly. And, and the good news is that some of them are, are relatively simple fixes, we believe. Um, and uh, therefore, we're not just plucking subjects out of the sky here. As Gagan says, uh, there is a problem out there uh, and we're trying to uh, sort that out here. So first section that we're going to discuss is going to be segregation. Um, when we discuss segregation, I'd like to bring firstly, um, Rod, uh, you've worked in the club for 10 years and before that you were a uh, master mariner on, on tankers. In your experience, um, do you see a lot of these? Uh, are they high value? What, what's your opinion on that? Uh, I think, I mean, claims arising directly from uh, segregation issues are probably, from our perspective, they're quite rare. But unfortunately, they're also usually quite expensive. Yeah, I think uh, that's I reflected think in those stats, isn't it? It does, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, James, um, from a surveyor's point of view, 
Is this something that you find yourself getting involved in a lot or uh, or not so much? Um, or what's your sort of experience along along the segregation issues? Still muted, James. Uh, James, you're still muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right, mate. Uh, we still see this in the surveying business, I think roughly around five to seven times a year, even in Rotterdam. So it's it's still there. Yeah. And what's the, the sort of usual um, cause of the issue that you find in your investigations? When they uh, when there is no double seg segregation, but only single valve segregation, then 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 we still that it still occurs. Yeah, and uh, with regard to those valves, um, I think we've discussed previously sort of uh, valve maintenance and things that you've seen along those lines uh, with testing, etc. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? We see a lot of stairs. In my opinion, too much reliance on the annual pressure test of the cargo lines. That seems to be sufficient for the for the for the ship's crews. Uh, what we don't see is an actual pressure test uh, just before the loading or discharge operation of those valves involved. I think that's quite important to do and also to keep records of that. Um, you can still have double valve segregation, but if you have uh, two tanks which share the same line between the tanks and the and the manifold crossover, then still uh, you uh, can uh, have a problem with contamination. Uh, failing failing uh, double valve segregations by means of improper uh, application of the yo-yos or the suit valves. Yeah, so it's, we, we we still see it. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. So I mean. Uh, Rod, practically speaking, James there is talking about the sort of relying on the uh, annual pressure test and the maintenance of the valves. Is that something that you uh, you back up uh, from the operations side when you were when you were there as well? I, th I think 100%. Uh, I would I would back up what James just said, but I would probably take a uh, maybe even a step back uh, back to basics, as it were. And I think it's it's as important that your your deck crew, your officers are. Uh, familiar with these systems, uh, the pipelines, the valves, uh, different types of valves you have on deck, how they operate, e even the, the directional flow of the valves and to, to ensure that they're inserted correctly. Um, very, very simple task for junior officers is to be able to go out on deck and trace your pipelines on deck and translate that back into the mimic boards that you see in the, in the slides there just so that they, they can understand when they, they start this pump or open that valve, that's what's happening out on deck, and that's the, the area on deck that they should be looking at. Um, it's It seems quite a simple approach, but getting back to basics to know your system and know your valves, I think it's very, very important. That almost sounds like something that could be added in, uh, maybe not in the immediate uh, sort of vessel familiarization, but sort of certainly something that you would expect them to be getting on with in that first period of them joining in their familiarization with cargo systems. Yeah, I mean, I always, you know, almost forced my, my junior officers out on deck and, and to be tracing the pipelines. Um, it's when you, when you go on product carriers and chemical carriers, it's just a, a mass of pipes on deck. And they've got to be able, to be able to understand how the cargo flows from the cargo tank to the manifold and how, you know, what valves it's going to be passing through and the different types of valves. It's, it's, it, it is very, very basic, but it's very, very important. Mm. Is that something that you see as well, James, maybe a lack of familiarity sometime with the systems on board when you turn up as a surveyor? Uh, yeah, and maybe the, the ABs on deck, they're quite familiar or can be quite familiar with the configuration, but yeah. Yeah, I think which which stay a lot in the CCR, which is part of their job, but mm -hmm. they they rely on schematic drawings only or layout on the console, and not the actual layout on deck. So I think yeah. there there's there's room for improvement there. Excellent. I mean, I, I mean, go ahead. I think that there's sometimes quite a, I mean, the schematic drawings that you see uh, on the left hand there and the mimic in the top right hand, they can be very very different to what actually is going out happening on deck so it's important that they get their head around it and the junior officers that we have today are the chief officers that will be sailing tomorrow yeah. so it's, it's it's imperative that these guys are trained to to understand the piping system and, and the the valves 
uh, and the pumps out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree on on all levels across the industry with that with that last point as well, Rod. I mean, we hear a lot when we're doing crew seminars, senior officers almost stating it's not really their job to teach the junior officers, and, and unfortunately, it kind of is because, as you say, when they're master, that junior officer they didn't really bother to spend much time with uh, is all of a sudden their their chief mate or second mate, and uh, so I, I agree. And and like I said at the beginning, whilst these seem like relatively um, simple steps, they are what we are seeing. Uh, when it comes to these claims. So it's almost good news that they're relatively simple steps and should be an easy fix. However, the one thing that obviously uh, James and myself and Rod aren't touching on is the potential commercial pressure that's put on uh, for this kind of, of loading and segregation. And, and so I'd invite the, the claims team, Rasmus and Gagan, to have a, have a quick discussion there uh, about um, how they can protect themselves maybe against future claims if, if they have to do this kind of loading. Thank you, John. Uh, here I think it's important to start by saying that uh, members are under no obligation to load or carry incompatible cargoes with single valve segregation. And this, uh, since it breaches the integrity of the design tank system of the vessel and therefore also the carrier's duty under the Hague VISP rules. Um, as we all know, the duties under the Hague VISP rules are to uh, carefully load, store, carry and care for the goods on board. But uh, as you all know, um, charters nonetheless and quite commonly request the vessel to load and carry the cargo with only single valve segregation uh, against a letter of indemnity. And faced with such a request, it should be kept in mind that accepting LOI for a single valve operation is a commercial decision for members and dependent on the specifics of the case. This LOI may not only supplement, but in fact, replace the PI cover altogether. Gagan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, uh, sitting sitting in the club, we often get the question, and some of you may also ask, why does an owner prejudice their PI club cover if they carry out such a common tanker operation, which is common request, very commonly requested from the charter? And not unheard of in the industry. It's 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 fairly common. I was at sea, uh, 13 years. I think I've always remembered getting a request once at least on a contract saying, "Can you load this cargo with single valve segregation?" At least where I was not on a on a crude uh, oil tanker. Uh, the answer from the club's perspective is that PNI club cover is based on how a prudent uninsured ship owner would act. And this is to protect the mutual membership. So the clubs are mutual. We are trying to protect all owners, not just one. If an owner was to build or buy a new ship or buy a secondhand ship, which was designed to carry three or four grades only with natural double valve segregation, then would that ship owner, if the ship owner was himself required to pay for the claim, would he or she uh, load more than those grades or more than those two or three grades without the double valve segregation? The answer is often or all the time, if not often, uh, no. The ship owner would not want to load with single valve segregation where the risk of cargo contamination due to one single valve leaking on a tanker is, is, is massive. Uh, and, and, and it's substantial and the cargo uh, is loaded and carried without the double valve segregation. However, if the owner still wants to go ahead and do this, for commercial reasons and load with single valve segregation, that should not then affect the other membership who are potentially not doing it at that particular time or not doing it generally. Uh, hence, the idea is to protect the entire membership from the increased risk. What happens is you load, you're defying the natural segregation of the vessel and it remains a commercial decision for the member. And in most cases, the LOI from the charter would effectively replace a p &I club cover. I mean, there anything to add about the LOI there, Erasmus, uh, um, with regard to who's issuing it? Um, thank you, John. Uh, as Gargan said, uh, the LOI may have to replace the p &I cover, and since the LOI then sort of becomes members' insurance, uh, with charters being the insurer. It makes the financial strength of the charters very important. Uh, if charters do not have the money to back up their promises, the LOI just becomes words on a piece of paper. And I also think it's worth to add that 
aside from the most common type of LOI situations, there are no standard approved wordings, which means that each wording will have to be specifically tailored uh, for the intended operation. And in this context, it's of course important to ensure that the agreed wording fully covers the planned operation and all the risks that may develop. And uh, at last, and to conclude, uh, in the latest, I would also say that the particular wording has become even more important uh, because some shorters, even some of the really big names, have tried if they can to avoid uh, the LOI responsibilities that they have committed to in the LOI. That's great. Thanks, guys. So um, technically, we're talking familiarization of the officers and crew, um, making sure they know what they're doing. Uh, evidence of uh, pressure tests and plan maintenance evidence, not just a list of dates, proper filled in plan maintenance. And then the claims guys are giving you some good hints and tips there with regard to LOIs, your obligations uh, and uh, financial stability, etc. Those are issuing the LOIs. Um, the next uh, sort of subject is relatively brief. Um, we have seen a couple of issues, not just with contamination, uh, but with other things to do with the uh, deep well pumps. Obviously, as we all know, uh, the deep well pumps uh, work with a, with a hydraulic oil. Um, James, I wondered uh, if you could fill us in into what causes uh, the leaks uh, from uh, deep well pumps into the cargo. Well, when there is a deep well pump in your cargo tank, the segregation between the hydraulic oil and the cargo in the tank is, is limited to two seals only and, and they cover them between those two seals. But w when both seals fail, uh, hydraulic oil uh, will get lost in your in your cargo. Uh, the the causes for that can be well, obviously poor maintenance, uh, but also the cargo itself. Uh, sulfuric acid, for example, uh, will uh, cause an increased wear of your of your seals. So I mean, if you're um, whilst you should maintain and, and keep an eye on these things all the time, uh, be particularly aware if you, if you've got a sort of cargo that could really uh, damage them as as well as poor maintenance. Um, yeah, it could be, and and there's a way to monitor that, and uh, I think everybody will be familiar with with the term purging. So uh, when purging is done according to the manufacturer's instructions and and records are kept accordingly, you can uh, carry out a a trend analysis of of your purging results, and I think that's quite paramount when it comes to to deep bulk cargo pumps. Mm, that, that's interesting when you use the word trend analysis, Rod. Um, I know that you're a big fan of the, the old Framer pumps um, and, you, and James there mentioned sort of recording these um, and, and tr noticing trends. Um, is that something that you've seen that is maybe missing? Well, I, th I think people are generally quite good at um, carrying out a purge routine and recording it. The, the Framer purging um, logs are, are pretty good and generally we do see them filled out uh, quite comprehensively. But the important thing is, it's again, it's come, back, it's come back to basics. It's been able to interpret results, interpret the discharge you're seeing at, at the purge outlet. Looking at the, you know, the, the, the discharge that you're recording in, in the log sheet and be able, be able to interpret what's going on um, uh, within the, 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 the pump casing and the seals from what you're seeing. It's very important that purge is not done just as a paperwork exercise. There's a reason for doing it, and it's important that the results are looked at and analysed. Uh, I'll I'll add something else very, very quickly, just as a, a quick segue. The, the the picture you've got there is obviously a Framel pump, but there's other types of, of deep well pumps out, out there, uh, and it's important to to understand what type of pump that you have, and understand the specific maintenance requirements for that pump. Yeah, I've sailed with the hydraulic framos, but I've also sailed with electric deep well pumps. So again, it's come back to understanding and knowing uh, what you have on board and the specific requirements linked to that piece of equipment. That's great. Thanks, Rod. Uh, James, with regard to the trends that you mentioned and, and the, the noticing sort of uh, issues that would be uh, potentially remedial action required, is there anywhere that members or crews can go to um, get help uh, interpreting those um, well, results? First, Framo, which is the, the world's largest supplier of deep hydraulic deep well pumps, 
they are they welcome uh, um, uh, the pur purging records. They will assist the owner in in interpreting the results. For That's correct. And I mean, I know you. I was lucky enough to go on a Framo tour with you, James, in in the factory there. So that's something that happens relatively regularly um, uh, from from owners that they can just uh, go straight back to the manufacturer. Yeah, I, I would say on a fifty-fifty basis, I see it. Okay, but it's good to know that some uh, manufacturers will take that and help out. So it's something that members could maybe, if they're not already doing it, investigate. Uh, sort of sending their records uh, back there. Um, and as well, just quickly on, oh, go on, sorry, James. If, if I may add, this, mm -hmm. um, I also sailed with the, this Framo system. Sometimes it's quite difficult to make a distinction between a allowed leakage of cargo and or hydraulic oil and, 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 and what is too much. And I think a, a company like Framo can assist with that. Provising, of course, that you have sufficient, <laughs> a sufficient quantity of records to show. Yeah, well, well maintained records, and as Rod or I always call it, uh, like a tick box exercise. You know, crew actually understand what they're filling in uh, to start with is always great. We see lots of things where they're filled in perfectly, and then uh, when something happens, uh, you, you kind of question why things weren't brought up at that time. Um, and just with regard to deep wells, obviously what you're talking about almost is like a remote check when you when you're doing your purging uh, there. Um, might not be the right terminology, but you understand what I mean. Rod, I know you're a big fan of actually getting up close and personal with these things when you when you can. Yeah, I mean, obviously with the thermal system, the, the there's a large proportion of the 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 actual uh, pump within the, the cargo tank. Uh, I think it's very important that when you do go down and do a, a tank inspection, um, and it's something we probably encourage you to do as often as you can do, don't just look at the bulkheads, look, look at the pump. Mm. You know, get, get a close up view of, of, of how the pump is, you know, it, it's all well and good doing a, having a, a very, very accurate and well maintained purging log, but you need to tie that in with official inspections as well. I mean, what we've touched on in the first slide and, and the second there is is really good evidence of maintenance. Uh, I mean, good records, not just dates or not just wait until it comes up in your PMS system. Uh, you know, so if, if you're doing something, even if it's out of schedule, get an unscheduled maintenance task in there and record it properly. Um, yes. Yeah. And I think if you're going, you know, so often we see um, the uh, tank inspections or, or planned maintenance reports where we, we just get the report has been good all mm, okay. Yeah, or a date, be, sometimes just a yeah, date. Yeah. Be, be as specific as you can. Use a, as much language as you can to describe what's going on. If you can, take pictures uh, if, you're, if your company procedures allow that. Uh, but just writing good or all okay, it's the, the more information you have serves as better evidence in the future. Um, there is an example of uh, the aforementioned purging uh, records and uh, as we've already discussed there, good, accurate, believable records and the crew to have an understanding of what they're, what they're all about uh, is, is something that we often, like Rod says, see filled in well but not necessarily interpreted very well. Um, now, tank condition. Is, uh, is the next subject. I know that we have a, a fair a few instances with this. Uh, I'll ask James first um, to discuss a little bit about tank coatings, different types and resistances, etc. James, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, there are, there are a small number of, of different types of coating, each of their own char characteristic, characteristics and of course their own resistance. I think we're all quite familiar with that. Uh, Mainly also because the number of, of products allowed in a cargo tank will greatly depend on the type of coating. Um, um, yeah, that's it, basically. You have uh, the resistance lists uh, yeah, for certain cargos. Um, and now the horror show photos are supplied by uh, James. Um, these obviously we, we don't like to see them, but uh, reality dawns here. Um, 
Rod, uh, you were talking a minute ago about every time you, you get into into a tank to, to look at the pump and, uh, and the bulkheads. Um, obviously, th- that's not necessarily a scheduled task, is it? Um, you know, if that opportunity arises. It's it's not, um, and I think you you've got to be able to. I think it's it should be quite easy to justify making an entry for spe- specifically to inspect the condition of the the tank and the condition of the the pumps, and form an accurate report of what's happening uh, within the, the the cargo tank. I mean, these pictures, the, the damage that we're seeing in these pictures, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, that there should be a, a record of tank inspection showing the condition of the cargo tanks. Um, and again, quite often we see tank inspection reports that, that say good, good, good. And then all of a sudden it's, Bad. you know, 14, 90% gone. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, inspect yeah. every opportunity, not just as per plan maintenance and record it. And by recording that you're maintaining a, a good level of evidence to help protect you if that claim arises in the future. Perfect. James, I mean, you supplied uh, a lot of the photos for this kind of thing. You must have turned up to a few. What kind of things are you doing when you when you turn up to something that looks like anything in these photos? What You mean what we did? Yeah, what, yeah. I think, yeah, well, th- th- this is what we saw. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, samples of the, the coating itself uh, can be helpful. In a case, yeah. in this particular case, you can see it on the photo left below. There was still some liquid behind the coating, so behind the coating and in front of the the mild steel bulkhead. So what we did is uh, we sampled it. There was some water in it because of the the cleaning carried out, but also some cargo remnants, which mm-hmm. which were determined in a lab, and we found that that those car uh, cargo remnants were from the third last voyage, which was actually a different charter. Oh, nice. I mean, uh, you agree with um, Rod's sort of, uh, I think we've discussed this before, the, the annual inspection regime versus what should be getting done. If you're in a tank, why why don't take a little bit more effort to to uh, record what, what you've seen? Yeah, 100% agree. And we've recently written an article on this and it wasn't just for tankers, it was for the industry wide plan maintenance systems excellent excellent form of evidence and as rod said and as james has sort of backed up why would you just stick to scheduled if you're doing a job it's a hard job it's a dirty job get it down as unscheduled maintenance get good good dialogue photographs all of these kind of things in the end um is is often what we just generally don't see done uh, date or as rod says good uh, something like that. I mean, um, given photographs like these, the claims guys, uh, uh, Raz and uh, Gagan, you must have seen uh, some things like this. Have you got anything to add uh, with regard to dealing with these kind of claims? Thank you, John. Uh, we have, and uh, when it becomes clear that the ship has contaminated the cargo, there are, as we all know, really no good defenses. Uh, this could be cases where it has been ascertained that the tank coating or the condition of the tank or the, uh, even the inert gas quality was the problem. And if that is the case, there is not much else to do from a claims handling perspective than to mitigate the loss and to negotiate the settlement best you can. Mm-hmm. Um, this said, uh, mitigation can of course be done in many ways, dependent on the characteristics and value of the cargo. And for instance, in a recent case we had, uh, the owners, in order to attempt to reduce the loss, actually had to buy their cargo from the cargo interests and then uh, arrange to reprocess the cargo. Uh, Other alternatives are, of course, always to look for a terminal which will and can accept the cargo as a lower grade product. And this could, for instance, be uh, discolored jet fuel, which is downgraded to benzene. Um, all that said, uh, our experience, to our experience, has been that where it's clear that the ship did not contaminate the cargo, the reality is still that it's always difficult 
and very expensive to defend uh, the claim on the basis that the product was contaminated before it was received on board. Uh, with some products, there may of course be an inherent vice defense. Um, if the cargo, for instance, goes off spec because of its own characteristics, like butadien that polymerizes in the ship's tanks because of the failure of the inhibitor. But again, as per the Hague VISP rules, uh, the ship has the burden of proof to evidence that there was an inherent vice in the cargo and that this particular vice uh, was the actual cause of the damage. And uh, this may this may be difficult to overcome unless the vessel has really, really strong evidence. And uh, yeah, from a practical viewpoint, and in most cases, a yeah. settlement is still the best option in, in, in these cases. I think that's great backup for what James and Rod said, uh, Rasmus. You know, when your claims handlers are sat there saying that it's very, very difficult to defend such things, you know, you straight back to that, uh, you know, increased maintenance, increased inspection, wherever possible, we're realistic and we understand that, you know, safety can prevent uh, tank entry, but, you know, we've got to make best endeavours to record uh, that we have made our best efforts to, uh, to, to keep an eye on these issues. Um, from tank coating, Slightly different uh, tank cleaning, and even I, with my uh, my lesser experience of tankers than the, than the likes of uh, Gagan and uh, Rod and James, uh, see plenty of these come across our desks. Where, uh, as far as I can work out, and I, uh, I often discuss this with Rod, um, the the fact it was clean was seemed to be determined from the main deck. Um, James. Um, have you anything, uh, any experience of, of that kind of uh, behaviour and the differences, uh, how we can uh, improve the cleaning method, if you like? Well, I think uh, it's not, first of all, it's not only about the, the method itself. I think about 10 years ago, that was the most important thing, that the method itself was what was in order from, from the last to the next cargo. Um, I think what's important is that the, the the cleaning machine, the fixed tank cleaning machine, or the portable one, um, it, it should be checked that it's actually rotating, that it's working, that there is sufficient water pressure, that there's the right temperature, that that the spray of water is indeed touching the bulkheads, uh, uh, etc. Um, I came across a few cases where the the even the, the documentation for the tank cleaning operation was was it, it was a document of 10 pages, I believe, even with, with timesheets and everything. In that particular case, it was actually quite helpful to prove that the vessel itself cleaned her tanks properly. Um, so um, similarly as your previous comments, I, I think some uh, increased record keeping regime uh, will assist the owner uh, uh, greatly. Yeah, I mean, back to evidence again that you are doing things properly. A lot of crew that, that you know, find themselves in this position, I mean, Rod, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of just assume that, that this is going well and uh, that because they were doing it right, they don't need to evidence it maybe quite so well. Um, I mean, your experience on board um, about tank cleaning. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll first, I'll probably just reiterate what James, James has said um, in relation to the, the tank cleaning machines themselves. Pressure and temperature are two of the key elements that are so often overlooked in tank cleaning. If you don't get the proper pressure, then you're not going to get sufficient um, contact with the bulkhead to clean it. Uh, if you haven't got correct temperature, then it's not going to have enough heat to to help you know dissolve the the, the cargoes left on the bulkheads. And sometimes there's a balance to be had to increasing the pressure. If you increase the pressure too much, then you, you run the risk of the temperature dropping. So th there is a balance to be had to getting good pressure and good temperature. But I think equally, and this is something that's quite often overlooked when people are tank cleaning, it's uh, keeping your tank top or the bottom of the, the cargo tank as dry as you can when you're tank cleaning. Because even a, a small uh, amount of liquid or, or tank washing that's on the bottom of your uh, cargo tank can make a big, big difference to the effect of the, the cleaning machine as it arcs round onto the bottom. So it's very, very important to keep the, the tank as dry as possible when you're going. And, you know, with the tank cleaning machines, one of the easiest ways to see if, if 
how effective they are is to get out on deck. If you stand uh, on top of the tank that's been washed, you can see the tank cleaning machine rotating. But more importantly, you can hear the, um, the water or the, the, the tank cleaning medium bouncing off the, the bulkheads. It's, it's generally quite loud. So get out there and listen and, and feel. Um, that way you can get a very, very uh, close up uh, point of view to make sure that the tank cleaning has actually been effective. Yeah. And of course, it's come back to you know, evidence that you the, the pressure that you're, you're generating, not just aft, but on, on the forward tank cleaning machines and the temperature that you're operating. Yeah, I mean, evidence again, the um Basically, the, the next subject along is the is the resounding message, and again, uh, you know, these are things that you're talking about standing on the deck and listening and things like that. But we still see coming through the club, uh, these basics uh, are not quite in place. Maybe a little bit of uh, the, the crew just sort of plodding on through their daily business and, and not quite uh, always uh, a little bit complacent, maybe. I, I don't know. But the crew familiarization and training, uh, again, rears its head. That, that, that They're on the ball there and the right person is out on deck uh, overlooking it. Is that a fair yeah, comment? Exactly. Yeah. exactly, yeah. I mean, so often we see cargo operations being you know, conducted entirely from within the CCR. Uh, and to get uh, whether it's tank washing or loading or discharging, it's very important to go out on deck and get a, a physical feel of what's going on on deck. It's not it's not a video game. You know, you've yeah. got to get out there and you've got to be in contact with what's going on. Exactly. And uh, Gagan, um, you must have seen a, a couple of problems with these both uh, at sea and since moving to the club. I was going to say I'll, I'll add two things to this, uh, and and one uh, might be a, rep- a repetition of what has already been said. But first, I'm going to touch upon what Rod said because uh, it was said very well, and it takes me back to my days at sea, and uh, the fact that you know when you're tank cleaning, uh, you uh, you as a cadet or, or 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 you tell your crew to kind of walk around and see which machines are running and which are not, because you can literally walk on deck and feel the machines uh, under your feet. Uh, and as a chief officer, you would go out and they can take a stroll uh, just to see the same thing, to reassure yourself. And as a master, uh, especially as a young master, where you're not 100% reliant on your chief officer, you again do the same thing while tank washing is going on, you go around. Uh, but yeah, the feel for things, um, to, to, to have mates on board who can, uh, can effectively, by sounds of things, I mean, uh, when you do long contracts, you realize that when when you when you're there, uh, even a small change in the pump in the pump room, you can actually feel it while you're sleeping. So it's it's quite a scary thought, but uh, takes me back to my sailing days. But moving on to the two things I wanted to say, uh, one, um, actually, um, how clean is clean? And that that's often a question that we get, uh, especially uh, more of a question for sensitive cargos. Uh, no matter how well you clean your tank no matter which tank cleaning guidelines you use, whether you use Dr. Verwey's, you use BP, Shell, whatever is relevant, it is only as good as you record it. And that's the repetition point. It is all about recording from a PNI or from a claims perspective. It is whether it was recorded properly or not. Now, that doesn't mean bullshitting. It means actually recording it. So evidence is the key. Uh, and, and we'll probably repeat this number of times during this talk today, but uh, the, the the result is often self-evident and mm-hmm. you can very quickly make out uh, if you get a claim whether the record was kept without the cleaning or the cleaning was done without the record being kept. It is so easy because you can quickly figure out uh, the fact that all these recording, all these guidelines uh, are fairly more stringent than what is required. Uh, but if you don't do them, then they're no good. And if you don't mm-hmm. record it, then it's absolutely useless. Um, the yeah. second thing I thought I'll, I'll, I'll mention, although not directly relevant, because all this we're talking about tank cleaning uh, is more relevant on product tankers and crude tank uh, and, and chemical tankers. However, and uh, there is something we should always remember is the importance of uh, crude oil washing. Uh, same machines often are similar, um, although this doesn't cause contamination uh, to crude oil and it, it, it's more of a question of shortage or cargo residue issues. However, 
uh, it's something to remember. And and that's the takeaway, I think, that comes out of just, just the walk through rod while walking through the tank cleaning machines. Crude oil washing remains one of the most important and potentially the most dangerous operations on a crude oil tanker. There's nothing more dangerous with the pressures that are going around in the, in, in the, in the crude oil line. And we will discuss this in more detail in our next tanker webinar uh, on tanker shortage claims. Uh, but this is just uh, somewhere in the middle, I've highlighted that there is more uh, to do with tanker claims and uh, in the future, something to look forward to. Uh, but that's about the two things I wanted to touch upon. Uh, nothing. Thanks, more. thanks, Gagan. That's excellent, and and a nice uh, sort of move over as well to remind us that that shortage claim in numbers is uh, almost as high as as the contamination uh, as well. Um, moving on to the next bit is is more the inspection of the of the tanks after cleaning, such as wall wash, um, wall wash testing. James, um, we see a lot in the club come across our desks um, saying that tanks are, are clean but when we look at it it actually is more empty <laughs> um, what, what have you got to say about the sort of testing of it being clean rather than just looking at it and saying it's clean are you involved in that you seen any problems uh, along along that line well, I, I agree with you that, that that such documents are based on visual assessments mainly on visual assessments uh, but of course, depending on the next cargo you're going to load, it may be wise to do some wall wash tests by uh, carried out by the uh, ship's crew. Uh, test kits are usually quite available on board, so there is a possibility to to take wall washes and 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 uh, test those samples to see if if cleaning was really effective. Of course, then then you do that already after the visual inspection has passed. Mm. Uh, yeah. Satisfactorily, but yeah, you you can do an extra step by doing it and recording it. Yeah, I mean, uh, next cargo, of course. We we get a lot of uh, questions maybe thrown at us about that from the other side often um, about you know, <laughs> the, it's only as high as the guy that was testing it. If 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 you like, you know, maybe uh, me at six foot five could <laughs> sample a little bit more of the wall than somebody else. But uh, I mean, do you agree that it's basically all we've got? Um, yeah, yeah, but just, if that's all there is, the, the, the ship's crew uh, can do. Um, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. then that's it. Uh, um, you don't want to build any scaffolding in the tanks just to check the condition of the the higher bulkheads. Exactly, best effort. Uh, I mm -hmm. think you put it to me once was a was a good way of uh, putting it. Rod, I mean, you must have seen both at sea and now in the club plenty of people uh, claiming tanks are uh, clean when actually the documentation they're handing over is more that they are empty. Yeah, and it all comes back to, I mean, we've seen so many times um, people issuing clean tank certificates when no tank entry has been made uh, and effectively all they've done is they've, they've opened up the, the hatch, shone the torch down and, and taken a quick look. That is, is not good evidence of, of a clean tank. Um, you don't, you know, for all cargoes, obviously, you don't necessarily need a wall wash, but getting down into onto the tank top and being able to run your, your fingers along the bulkheads to, to see what residue is there, uh, what, 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 if there's any sediment in the bottom of the, of the wells, mm. yeah, it, it's, it's, it's up close and personal. Uh, it's, it's yeah. good evidence, you know, affect that tank entry, get into the tank and make sure it's clean. And evidence uh, you, it as well, as you say, you know, uh, that's often uh, Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, for, ev for every tank entry, really, there should be uh, an entry permit. And quite often, we, we that's one of the things we'll ask for, that, you know, as, as backup evidence that the tank entry was done. And so often that these things can't be provided. Mm. So it, it then, you know, the balance of probability is then the tank inspection was done from from the, the hatch 15 yeah. 20 meters above the, the bottom of the, the cargo tank it's exactly right and and you know i i suspect a lot of our members that are listening in are all well aware and they're, they're nodding their heads however like i said at the beginning whilst these seem like relatively simple problems they are what we are seeing 
uh, both from a survey point of view, as, as uh, sort of uh, voiced by James, and uh, from the club point of view, uh, mm. the, these are the problems that we are seeing. So, I mean, the good news is, I suppose, is that with a bit of best practice, they're simply addressed to hopefully reduce that huge 61% of all uh, tanker claim uh, values. And I think just picking up on uh, something you said, you know, best efforts, if you can go down into the, the, the cargo tank and or you can evidence that the part that you can reach is, is clean, if you have good tank cleaning records, then the part that you are, are, are testing at head height should be representative of the effectiveness of the cleaning that you've done. Hmm. So you that tank cleaning or the tank inspection coupled with good evidence of good tank cleaning is quite strong evidence that the whole tank should be representative of that area that you're sampling at head height. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know Gagan, you mentioned how clean is clean. Have you got anything else to add? Uh, to, to no, cleaning? just to echo what, 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 what everyone has said. I think it's absolutely important to do the right thing to go down the tanks. I think that is something we've completely caught on to is it's reducing by the day. Every next claim that we get, we realize that uh, either a tank entry was not made or not made by somebody senior enough to be able to verify what the crew had done. Uh, reliance on crew is good, but verification needs to be done. And that's the key message and recorded and the chain of recording that you did a tank cleaning you did the gas, you did the purging, then you did the gas cleaning, uh, gas freeing, then you did the man entry, and whether you mopped or did not mop, everything needs to add up because uh, these are things that come out if the case gets to arbitration and quite quickly. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Guy. Um, moving on to uh, kind of the final subject, but one of the bigger ones is the off spec, and in particular, the importance of sampling we're going to start with and actually i'm going to turn it around a little bit because i'm going to start with the claims guys and uh, rasmus the importance of sampling to you guys rasmus can you can you give us a little bit about uh, the aftermath if we do or do not do sampling thanks man. of course um I, th I think we all have seen cases where there has developed a standoff between the terminal and owners on whether cargo came on board contaminated or whether the cargo was contaminated on board. Um, and what these situations, at least to, to our experience, boils down to is uh, us versus them. And if a good outcome is to be achieved, uh, us needs to include shorters. Uh, it is therefore imperative to bring shorters on site as soon as possible by proving to them that the vessel is in the right. Uh, the risk is elsewise, as you probably have experienced, that shorter sides with the terminal, which will mean double pressure on, on, on the ship and the owners. Uh, this is not an easy task. Some shorters, as you will know better than me, are very difficult to convince as they think it's much easier to blame the vessel. And um, um, and one will also have to keep in mind that sometimes there are, of course, no optimal solutions, like if it's impossible for the terminal to take off uh, the off-spec cargo. Um, but that said, uh, it's, of course, one thing to have a problem and have to pay for solving it, and another to have a problem that at least someone else will have to pick up the bill for. And going back to where John started, um, in, in this context, uh, samples, manifold samples, uh, can in this context save the day and solve the problem. Uh, yeah. Gagan? I would just add to what Rosman said and, and absolutely agree. And evidence is the key to successfully defending any allegation of cargo contamination, um, whether it be on a crude oil tanker, product tanker, chemical tanker, any form of tanker, evidence. Sampling at the right time the right place, right quantity of samples, and the most important thing is right recording of the samples. So not just taking it, but you have to record it and storing it properly. Um, these are all important pieces of evidence, and often missing, often missing. Um, dealing uh, as an example, I'll give you a very, very recent example where we've had a case recently where it was clear to us that the people we were dealing with in the ship owner's office 
uh, people who we speak to on a regular basis understood, understood the problem, understood the requirement of samples, understood the importance of sampling, uh, but on board the ship when we tried to address this uh, or our, our rep, the uh, attending surveyor tried to address this, uh, it was a completely different story. Uh, the crew were apparently reluctant, unsure, and to some point probably um, irresponsible when taking samples. I think the importance wasn't given to sampling uh, that that it deserves. Uh, it was probably just something they need to do and mm -hmm. just get a bottle and just put it somewhere. That is not sampling. Uh, there is much more to it, and it is, as we said, one of the most important evidence you can have. After what you've just said there, Gag, and I'd like to just uh, ask James, as the surveyor, I mean, I know we've talked about this, James, in the past, but is, is that something that you can echo as the surveyor, the sort of reluctance of the crew to almost to get involved sometimes? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're not in all cases, but in some cases, I, uh, me or my colleague uh, come on board and, and the crew is actually expecting that you uh, uh, take it over, that, you, that you, you sit in the driving seat. Uh, mm. And then they just take a rest or something, but we're there to assist them. So we actually need them to to build our case to protect owner's interest. Mm, I think that's an important message as well, James. Uh, Rod, would you would you agree with that? Uh, wholeheartedly, um, I think it, it, it is quite common for the, the crew almost to switch off uh, as soon as the severe comes on board and thinks that they will just get on and do everything and they will be uh, entirely responsible for, for everything that they do and, and all the samples that they, they take. Um, but I mean, going back just to, to the importance of sampling, Gagan talked uh, very well about, you know, the importance of taking a sample at the right place and the right time. But equally important, I think it's the right person taking the sample. Having a you know, an AB or an OS out on deck taking a sample or a manifold taking a sample. The level of, of experience that they have may not be the level that's required to form a good evidential chain to prove that that sample is uh, it, it, it's either on spec or off spec or a reliable sample. So having someone with experience who, who's checking a sample, not just taking a sample for, for the sake of taking a sample, just to tick the box, Mm. It's very, very important that the person who's taking it can recognise what's good and what's bad. Yeah, and, a, a and act on it. Yeah, I think that's a great message. A great message across the industry, not just in the tankers. I think, uh, you know, as I said before, tick box exercising is becoming uh, the norm, uh, unfortunately. But while we have James and we're just discussing the surveyor there. Um, the importance of an independent surveyor. So, James, you said clearly there you're there to support the crew, not do their job for them. And that is something that you are seeing more of, would you say, over the last, what did you say, 15 years that you've been uh, surveying now? I, I have to say it's, it's getting better and better. Better? That's good. Yeah. In my That's experience, good. yeah, it's getting better. Yeah. Uh, record keeping is, is, is getting better. Uh, taking of samples is getting better. Labeling it. So it, so that, that's good for my job. Uh, fortunately, it still goes wrong, but yeah, we, we, we're there to to uh, uh, to assist and we have to rely on the ship's crew. So what has already been done before we arrive uh, can be very helpful. So if they have done that in a diligent way, that that's quite useful. Yeah. Um, Rod, I think you've covered it already, but just try not to switch off just because someone like James rocks up uh, on board up the gangway, uh, I think is, is an important message. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I think just picking up on what James said, I think it's quite reassuring to hear that things are getting better because we generally, uh, as a club, only really hear about things when, when they go wrong. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and if James is, is um, you know, at the call face and seeing things actually improving, yeah. then there is probably hope for us all. Yeah, I think um, just just to touch quickly on the surveyor and what he does when he gets there. I believe you've said to me, James, uh, sometimes it, it depends on what instructions you are given with regard to sampling as well. Is that, is that correct? No, not particularly for me, but that, that, that was a comment for the cargo inspector. Uh, yeah, yeah. The so the guy takes the samples on behalf of charters or cargo. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, and, and when it comes to the use of independent surveyors, of course, if there is an issue, it lands squarely with Rasmus and um, Gagan. Uh, I mean, the use of independent surveyors must be uh, positive when claims handling. Thank you, John. It most definitely is. Um, what we see in our claims handling is that uh, gathering good and preferably independent evidence is critical to being able to successfully defend a claim. And the key to this is, uh, as we've touched upon here, uh, the crew, uh, members office, of course, uh, but also the surveyor. Um, the ABs and the officers, they will, even if they uh, should support the surveyor, they will have other tasks to perform. But the surveyor's purpose of being on board is, is just that, to assist the crew in collecting evidence. And what we also have seen in practice and what I think is worth keeping in mind is that the independent surveyor's findings are less likely to be criticized by claimants. And aside from that, findings of the surveyor are unbiased. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, but the, the survey world is relatively small and the surveyor used by your shortcuts today may be used by you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds about right, Rasmus, definitely. Um, so, I mean, given the, the huge sums of money, 61%, as we saw, really, the the, the appointment of a surveyor is, is, uh, is definitely a uh, positive. Just very quickly, we're going to have a look at some of the sampling points, shore tank and shoreline and manifold and then the ship's tank itself and I, I like the terminology used by Gagan the other day when it came to manifold and we had a discussion about it the god of samples as he referred to which I liked um, so shoreside sampling um, Gagan uh, I know that uh, shoreside and shoreline sampling you you had something that you uh, wanted to discuss on this uh, regarding the sort of access to the to this kind of thing yeah, just that we, we still do see a lot of resistance from a lot of terminals uh, to allow shoreside sampling or where there's an issue and we want to send somebody to shore, whether it is on the, on the uh, they, they give different reasons, you know, currently it's COVID as an excuse for everything. Uh, but even before that, we were seeing excuses coming from the terminals. So the point we're trying to make here is if you know there is a problem before the vessel arrives, and, and most of our members do this, to, to be fair to them. Uh, they would tell us that there is, a, there is a potential issue, whether we've had some vapor contamination because, uh, you know, we didn't, we forgot to blank the IG, uh, IG lines between the two uh, tanks and there's vapor contamination, or whether there's any other form of contamination or a risk of contamination. We can line up a survey beforehand, especially for access to the shore side, because you never know what gets ashore and what they do with it. And we'd like to sometimes know what the final outcome is, how they've mitigated it. And uh, it, it really helps because sometimes terminals might knowingly take uh, little contaminated cargo to try and put it into their tank, which has already got contaminated cargo and blame the vessel for it. So the only way to find all that out is to have access. Yeah, I believe, James, that you've sort of intimated to me that it's usually after the fact that you get involved in shore tank sampling. Yeah, yeah, and, and when it's relevant, then we also try to get access to the cargo in a shore tank. And and I agree that that, that can be quite difficult sometimes. I, I would also like to em emphasize that the focus uh, on the shore side should not only be the shore tank. Uh, it should also include the shoreline and the yeah. configuration of, of those shorelines and shore tanks. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, some of those is quite some length, though. That could be, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think, like I said, I like the terminology, so I'll move on to it relatively quickly. Manifold samples, um, God of samples, as uh, we've already heard about it a little bit from uh, Rasmus. But uh, James, uh, you said before you think things are maybe getting a little bit better. Um, how about you let us know? The, the sort of things that you're seeing and the importance in your in your opinion of the manifold sample. Well, the, the manifold is where your cargo enters your ship. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a quite important location um, to take a sample, uh, set aside from the Inkle terms, of course. 
You you once said to me uh, relatively recently that from time to time, given the importance of the manifold sample, that you were still maybe not seeing the kind of personnel you would expect to see at the, the manifold. No, uh, the, the understanding of the purpose of a manifold sample is getting much better. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, I still see a lot of cases where there's only one manifold sample, whereas you would expect maybe maybe 10 because of the involvement of multiple short tanks or sh stoppages or sh changeovers, etc. Mm. So multiple multiple sampling at that point. Yeah. And, and Rod, is this something that you, you back up? Uh, wholeheartedly, yeah. Uh, the, um, I think the importance of the manifold sample just, I don't think it can be underestimated. Um, it's it's going to give uh, an indication of the condition of the cargo as it's coming on board and passing into the custody of the vessel. Um, and as James Riley said, it's it's not just the first flow that you want to be taking a sample of. It, it's you know the sample af or after any stoppage, after any change of shore tank. Um, I would even say after any any drop in in pressure coming from uh, pr from the shore side, but when you're taking a sample, it's, I'll just go back to reiterating my back to basics philosophy. It's very, very important that the pe person taking a sample understands what they're looking at mm. and under, under, understands the importance of it. And that sample is then label, labelled and retained and logged correctly. Is that, I remember going out to the, um, a manifold once and seeing a bucket with you know, six or seven glass bottles of of, uh, of liquid in it with no labels. And yeah. uh, the AB at the manifold uh, had no idea where they came from and we had, we had four hoses connected. So right. it's very, very important when you take the samples that you, you label them correctly and they're retained and logged correctly. Is that something that you echo, James? You see uh, the, the sort of evidencing and documenting those samples? Yeah, I fully echo that. The, you may have a perfect manifold sample, but if it has no label or if if, the, um, if it was not properly retained, yeah, then then the, the whole representative identity of the sample uh, may fail. Yeah, I mean, we talked about multiple samples there, or, or James mentioned it and Rod and, and Gag, and we've had a couple of cases, one fairly recently, where multiple samples were taken, um, but maybe they weren't um, assessed properly uh, by, by the crew. Absolutely. Uh, it's not just getting the sample on board. And that's where experience, which Rod mentioned. Uh, so not just the right place, right time, also the right person who is picking up the sample and looking at it. Uh, who is, is somebody smelling it? Just the smell when you're taking sample can tell you whether it's gasoline or gas oil. Uh, but you need to have that kind of experience to be able to do that. Um, often it's raining, it's miserable. Uh, it's uh, the, the pressure is already too high. Um, as uh, I, I was not the best mate, I was probably too strict, too bad as a mate or as a master. And the 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 analysis or the analogy I would give is my uh, instructions used to always be go and bloody take the sample. It's yeah. it, there are always excuses, there are always reasons why it's difficult. Uh, there are always reasons why you can't tag a bottle at the right time. You need you need somebody to to coordinate all that. You need to if you can't do it on on deck, you take one sample, come to the CCR, you go back, take another, so that somebody's marking it in a in a clean, dry place. Um, excuses are very good. Uh, they don't work when a claim comes. The issue is they come only once, but when they come, they're very expensive. Um, contamination claims can be avoided if manifold sample was taken. God of all samples. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got the sample from the manifold, you know if the cargo that's come on board was already contaminated or not. And that can be a game changer in any contamination claim. Yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, Rasmus. Game changing the whole manifold. Uh, Rasmus, have you got anything to add? Yes, Jon. Um, another aspect of what has been said and worth keeping in mind is the shipping terms of the underlying sale contract between the shippers and the receiver. Uh, if the cargo is shipped, for instance, free on board FOB or uh, cost insurance freight CIF, uh, the title and risk pass to the buyer when the cargo passes the ship's manifold intake. And it is at this same point that the ship's 
a ship takes custody of the cargo in the legal sense and therefore potentially becomes responsible if something is wrong with the cargo from the outset. Um, once the risk for the cargo passes, and this is something we have seen from time to time, is that the shipper may lose interest in the cargo and uh, be less forthcoming with assisting in, in finding a solution. Uh, the shipper is not at risk anymore, so why, why should he care? Uh, Therefore, uh, to avoid ending up with a problem that someone else is responsible for, uh, manifold samples taken at the start of loading are, as we have heard here, critical in establishing whether or not the product, pro product complies with its contractual load specifications. Um, on the other hand, if, uh, if manifold samples are not taken and the ship loads cargo which has been contaminated shoreside uh, a not spec claim against the ship uh, will be very difficult if not impossible to defend um, there will be no proof of that this was not the ship's fault mm. well, excellent and um Gagan, you mentioned to me a couple of places i think you said saudi way and james you might mention malta when we discussed this in the past that aren't allowing uh, manifold samples through safety um and there you are, have some advice for that, Gagan? Uh, unfortunately, there are a couple of terminals we know of now where they are, the, the terminal is always reluctant to allow a manifold sampling and the pretext they use is it's a safety concern. Uh, we do not believe it is a safety concern for one reason that the rest of the world is allowing it and nothing has happened so far uh, when taking manifold samples. However, if you are in that position, then uh, you do need to protest and you do need to make that protest known to everybody that this is not acceptable. Unfortunately, that's the best a ship owner can do at this stage uh, yeah. because some of these are government backed uh, terminals and it's not easy uh, to challenge them. We are challenging some of these things on an industry level, but that's a slow moving target. Yeah, that's great. So LOP timely. Um, at, at the point where you weren't allowed to take it and just as a sort of um, forewarned is forearmed type thing if you're going if any of our members are going to a new terminal where they've never been before um, don't be afraid to put in an inquiry to the team either LP or claims and we have people on the ground that can confirm this kind of thing um, and these kind of problems so that you you can at least be forewarned before arrival um, so can, manifold can yeah, quickly just uh, throw something in there as well, John. If, um, I mean, there are just a, a handful of, of terminals that don't allow you to take a, a manifold sample. If we're faced with uh, these ports and these restrictions, I think it's even more important that we have a, a good chain of evidence to prove our uh, due diligence in preparing the cargo tanks and, and cargo lines prior to arrival. So it's even more important that accurate and, and good quality uh, tank cleaning records, tank cleaning uh, inspections are, are maintained on board. Um, in just 100%. in case that in an unlikely event that you can't take that manifold sample. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And that is great advice. And, and I often say to a lot of ship owners, you know, we want that to be the case all the time, you know, that, that to be the standard that they maintain with regards to preparation and evidence. Uh, but as you say, very important in a case like that. And hopefully we'll be able to find out before your arrival that if that was the case or not. Um, thank you. So first foot, uh, James, reason for the first foot sample and the importance of it in your opinion, please. Well, you see first foot sampling less and less. Uh, it still occurs when you have uh, sensitive or, or, or expensive cargoes. And unfortunately, still first foot samples uh, are taken, um, which is a, a quite can be quite beneficial because with a, a, a limited quantity of cargo, uh, you, you can uh, check the condition of, of quite a large surface of the whole vessel. Eh? For example, let's say 2% of the total quantity of the cargo um, can tell you the condition of about 35% or even maybe even 40% of the surface of the vessel, including the cargo lines, which are usually uh, quite difficult to respect or neglected. Mm. So and, uh, we call it the test batch, actually, in my industry. Okay, so, so a good one. Uh, Rod? It, 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 uh, I, I have to on. add one thing. It only helps when uh, first food samples when the condition of that is is assessed either visually or in a in a labor uh, in a lab 
again, Rod, I think you've got some fairly strong, as you've voiced before, about that assessment, if you like. I mean, uh, James, I think, just basically took uh, the words right out of my mouth there. If you're going to be taking a first food sample, it's so important that it's assessed by someone who's competent enough to be able to identify if there's a problem. Because mm. the, the, yeah, the whole reason that you take a first food sample is generally the... The cargo that you're loading is it's a higher spec and therefore usually a high value cargo so you want to be able to identify if, if there's a problem at the earliest opportunity yeah i think that's been a resounding theme throughout and something that maybe we've seen unfortunately is, is that that hasn't been done it's been like that tick box i'm taking the sample i'm taking a sample but we're not paying enough attention to it to what it shows us at that time uh, to maybe even if you just say right stop it there while we work out if there is something wrong could save quite a lot of hassle yeah but uh, if you've got lot. if you've got a good first foot sample and a good manifold sample it's in my opinion very strong evidence that you've prepared your vessel correctly for the carriage of the cargo in question yeah exactly. I don't know if the claims guys would, would would agree with that um yeah i mean uh, rasmus have you got any uh thoughts on on the these sampling Technical hitch. Sorry right. for that. That's Sorry right, for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, to re-emphasize what has said before, uh, samples are imperative, and uh, from a claims handling perspective, it is as James and Rod said earlier, uh, extremely important that our, the samples are taken correctly. But also, in order for the samples to maintain their value as evidence, uh, that the samples are handled, stored, and kept correctly. Uh, if there are any breaks in this chain, let's say that the seal has been broken or if a claimant were not invited to attend uh, a lab testing, uh, claimants or even a court uh, will surely pick up on it and what elsewise would have been a good defense may fall apart just because the samples were not handled properly. So what I want to push on here is uh, take samples but do also handle them uh, correctly. Um, Gagan, anything to add on that? Um, more from a first foot point of view, um, as James said, you know, often they're not tested, they're just looked at, but sometimes they are tested uh, for even more sensitive cargo, especially chemicals, um, and where they are tested and the sample fails, then the manifold sample, again, the link I'm trying to draw between the manifold sample and the, and the tank or the first foot sample, uh, is very important because then you can prove that that contamination was not yours if it is. If it is, if it is something that the vessel has caused and if the sample is tested and analyzed and it appears that the tanks were not fully, absolutely washed or whatever the reason, but it's slightly off spec, then there are occasions where we may accept and agree with the owner that another foot can be loaded to do a theoretical calculation to see if that uh, contaminant or that off spec nature reduces. Uh, so, say for example, the cargo is off spec by a very slight margin, but by loading another foot, you can it comes down. You can just do a very quick theoretical calculation to say if you were going to load thousand tons of it, would it go within spec? And most of the times, the answer is yes. But we can't give as a club, we can't give a car blank approach and say, well, go ahead and do it, owners. So. Yeah. Case we would like case. that discussion, yeah. So owners would ex uh, we would expect the owner, and most of the owners do, to be fair to them, would approach us. And it does take uh, a few hours, but mostly we've managed to get it sorted. Uh, so just to take a, take away from some something from that first place. Rod, you had a comment about that sort of technique, though, with regard to re-emphasizing the manifold important. Yeah, I mean, um, that, uh, that approach of almost um, diluting a uh, contaminant I think it only really works if if you uh, if you can ascertain that the cargo coming on board at the manifold is, is on spec, uh, and you're not just reintroducing more contaminants into into the cargo tank. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it, it's linking back to the importance of the manifold sample, and then in the, in the bigger picture, tying it in with uh, the first boot sample to get a, an idea of of what's actually going on within the the cargo system pipe the uh, cargo pipe work and the cargo tank excellent and i'd just like james to touch very briefly on the other type of sample in there which is the running sample top middle bottom 
when you would use those maybe and the difference between them. I know you and Rod had a good chat about uh, how the bottle should be at the end of these samples uh, as old tanker hands. But if you could just give us a quick run through of the difference and what the uses of those, please. Yeah, I, I think the type of samples you want when, when you have a case is, is dependent on the type of cargo. Uh, usually a running sample will suffice for a homogeneous cargo and top, middle and bottom or upper, middle, lower if you like. Uh, is more for the non-homogeneous cargo. Um, what, what I always see uh, and, and which fills qu quite a lot with cargo inspectors is that they fail to take a proper running sample. And they take a running sample and it, the bottle comes completely filled up uh, uh, on deck. It's not a proper running sample. The running samples should be filled for only 70, maybe 80 percent only. So uh, when it's not filled up completely, it's a confirmation that the last drops uh, at the at the upper upper level of the of the cargo has entered the the, the sample bottle. Uh, um, I also may add that I'm not in favor of taking only composite samples of those running samples or upper middle lower samples. So when individual samples are taken, they should be retained as well and not not mix them to become composite samples only. Or individual samples mix, uh, not mix. They keep them individual, signed, sealed and documented as such. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Rod, do you agree with that? I know you were nodding profusely the other day when we were talking about the full full sample bottle. Uh, yeah, it was again one of my little uh, bugbear stats when, when I was at sea. But I think yeah, a, a good running sample is, is probably uh, should be representative of what's, what's in the cargo tank. Any other sample, um, top, middle, bottom, if you're taking them, again, I think it's important for it to be recorded and the height of the that you're taking it uh, recorded um, so that you can differentiate your top, your middle and your bottom samples. Every evidence, evidence, evidence. Again. It does. It's, it yeah. goes back to, you know, good record keeping, um, labeling, uh, re retaining and, uh, and logging it. Common theme throughout the day, I think, evidence and uh, proper documentation. Uh, right, so one final thing, which I'm going to hand over entirely to Gagan and Rod. Uh, slight current trend, as um, Gagan alluded to earlier, um, that there are some things happening at the moment due to things like the pandemic that maybe we don't see so frequently. Uh, so, guys, if you'd like to just uh, run us quickly through the storage trend. Thanks, John. Um, uh, let me let me start by saying we all know that every time the price of any commodity drops substantially or where there is a possibility of the price of a commodity rising in the near future, uh, someone somewhere wants to make money of it. Someone somewhere wants to store it and make money when the price goes up. Uh, this is more prevalent uh, an issue or as some traders will call it, uh, a great initiative from their part in the oil trade. Uh, where oil prices can fluctuate substantially due to war, pandemic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, any major event. Um, as an example, this pandemic uh, meant fall in crude oil prices, which led to fall in prices of other hydrocarbons. Most importantly for us, uh, and uh, the, 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 the fact that airlines industry uh, reduced drastically, and hence the price of jet oil uh, reduced substantially. While North is here to allow our members to trade with confidence, while our overriding aim is to support our members uh, where they can safely use their vessel to store uh, a cargo, um, and where sh such, uh, such storage is contemplated under the contract of carriage, that is very key and very important. However, floating storage can, and uh, any prolonged storage uh, certainly does, uh, it bring with it some challenges and often many complications, uh, let alone the increase in exposure to your, as an owner, your risk when uh, the prolonged, st prolonged storage involves sensitive high value and high impact cargoes such as uh, jet oil. Um, it, there are lots of protective clauses out there. Some of you, I can, I, I've seen the list, a lot of you have actually discussed uh, these with already. Uh, and the, these this is all contemplated before fixing a voyage. So if you're fixing a voyage where you're going to store the cargo, yes, there is 
all that available and we will help you. Uh, it becomes more of an issue uh, when the vessel is already loaded with cargo and then asked to store cargo on board for a prolonged period. That is when the problem starts, because if you were to do that, then it is there is a big risk of deviation under the contract of carriage uh, if the ship is used as a floating storage. Um, and, and, and the contract of carriage does not often, in that case, uh, contain the protective clauses or, as we say, just the remarks, at least a remark on the bill, uh, which should not be confused with a clause, uh, because you can make a remark on the bill that the cargo will be stored as against uh, uh, carried from A to B. Um, besides the legal implications of deviation, prolonged storage also increases the risk of cargo deterioration, especially cargoes like jet. Um, and, and there are other cargoes which actually have other issues. But um, the, the problem for us is, hence we always ask our members uh, to ensure that the chance of cargo deterioration are low. Uh, it is for the member to go away. We can help them get in touch with experts uh, to find out what the, what the risk is with a particular cargo. Uh, we've been involved in a number of these cases and discussions with a lot of, uh, lot of our members in the last eight, nine months. And we remain available to discuss any further issues that our members might face uh, with regards to ongoing issues, uh, with potential use of their vessels as floating storage. I don't want to take too much time, but if you've got any questions on it, please feel free to come back to us and we'd be happy to discuss. Uh, does that help? Yeah, thanks, Gagan. Uh, Rod, I believe you've recently gone into type on this matter. Uh, yeah, and it, it almost sounds like Gagan's uh, read my article. Um, <laughs> he's, he's covered most of the things yeah. from a practical perspective. I mean, cargo deterioration is something that um, we probably would be concerned about, especially in long term storage um, for cargoes like like jet which we saw uh, quite a few members asking about there can be uh, things uh, like gumming and excess sedimentation and uh, water drop out of it and there can even be things like cargo loss through excessive uh, vapor loss through venting um, which can be a problem in certainly warm climates and even you know thinking about where you're, you're looking at storing this um, I know off the coast of California, they, they've put a, a ban completely on, on tankers venting at any point. Um, so, you know, m maintaining your, your your vapor space and your, your vapor pressures within the cargo tanks would come even more important um, in, in that sort of, of area. But the, 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 the amount of cargo loss you can get through um, venting as a result of the diurnal variation can be quite substantial if it's uh, stored for a prolonged period of time. So, I mean, all these things are are elements that you know the ship owners should be certainly aware of when considering um, long-term storage. Thanks, Rod. That's excellent. And again, um, as Gag and, and Rod have both alluded to, if you want to know more about that subject. No problem, just drop us a line and we can ask. And that is the case for any of the subjects uh, that we've covered today. If you want to go a bit more in depth, that is no problem at all. We can uh, arrange something for you. James, I've got one last favour from you. Could you please pronounce your new consultancy name since I've butchered your name already? Maybe you could uh, let, let the members know the name of who you work for again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. oh sorry. Say again, uh, James. The Haas from Oosterhout. Thank you. I would have definitely but, not but made it sound I can make it a, a bit more simple. Um, our website name is just uh, marine-experts.com. Excellent. So marine-experts.com if you want to get in touch with James. Um, also, any of our publications are available to all our members. All you need is a My North account. If you want to ask questions after the fact, there's two email addresses there. You can either ask us at North or you can ask James. Sorry, James, I didn't. I forgot to change it to your personal one, but you'll still get it here at yeah. info at marine-expert.com. Um, I would like to thank James and the rest of the panel uh, for, for contributing. It's been excellent. Um, and I'd also like to wish the members a Merry Christmas and hopefully a much improved New Year on 2020. And we will keep you in the loop as to when the next webinars are and in particular when the next tanker webinar uh, will be.